Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, two interviews on programs that allow Fukushima children and their families a break from living in their radiation-contaminated homes. We'll talk first with Vicki Nelson and Fukushima resident Tokiko Noguchi about Fukushima Friends Hawaii Ministries Outreach, a program which provides time, housing, and activities in Hawaii. That's paired with an interview on Komoro Homestay, which brings children and their mothers to the relative safety of southwest Japan. We'll be talking with the program's founders, Laura and Gichi Inoue. Those interviews, plus numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, and more nuclear information than Hillary Clinton's handlers have approved for her to say. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, June 9, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Just back from vacation and zipping through the news this week, officials in Japan admitted that nuclear fuel material leaked at Fukushima into water in a ditch, and from there it leaked into the port at 22,000 becquerels of beta-ray-emitting radiation per liter of water, the figure is the highest ever recorded in the port. TEPCO reported another quote-unquote small radiation spike on June 6th. This newest release coincided with a small amount of rain at the plant, so of course that's what got blamed for it. And the dog ate it. Japan's government still plans to end rent subsidies for some evacuees from the nuclear disaster, even as the public learned that those subsidies cost less than one-third of the total relief budget, just 8.09 billion yen for this fiscal year, or just over $65 million. The government and TEPCO also announced a new plan that would terminate compensation payments to businesses impacted by the disaster. Meanwhile, these same bureaucrats are scratching their heads because new polls have found that the majority of younger residents, originally from the towns in the evacuation zone, have absolutely no intention of returning and see themselves living somewhere else as soon as they become adults. Can you blame them? Still, Satoshi Endo, mayor of the town of Hirono in the evacuation zone, said, the results are very shocking. Satoshi Endo, mayor of the town of Hirono in the evacuation zone, said, The results are very shocking. And a senior official for the Fukushima prefectural government said that they will present a clear vision so young people can have hope about their hometowns. Delusional. Japan has finally approved the restart of its nuclear power industry. But now the eruption of a volcano near one of the facilities is raising new questions over safety. Ya think? Just two days after Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority approved a restart for the Sendai nukes, on May 29, nearby Mount Shindake erupted on a small nearby island of Kuchinoirabujima, and on Monday, June 8, more than 85 volcanic blasts were recorded in a single day. And still, Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, or METI, has announced that by 2030, The country will be getting between 20 and 22 percent of all of its electricity from nuclear. Interestingly, just last week, the Pro-Nuclear International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, issued a report saying that Japan's overconfidence and excessively firm belief in the safety of its nuclear power plants was among the main reasons why the country was unprepared for the Fukushima Daiichi disaster in 2011. Let's pray that history does not repeat itself. And now, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of the week. Care to drown your sorrows in some award-winning sake with that indefinable something that gives it an edge? Well, Fukushima Prefectures got what you want because their artisanal producers won the most grand prizes in the annual Japan Sake Awards. This for the third straight year since four years ago, 
the nuclear disaster began in their backyard. 24 of the 222 brands awarded grand prizes came from breweries in the disaster-hit prefecture and were made with locally grown rice. Those spirits helped to lift the spirits of brewers still struggling with the effects of the nuclear accident, or maybe just helping them to forget the radiologic nightmare that they have found themselves in the middle of. To anyone who buys and drinks this sake, congratulations! You are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. We'll catch up with the rest of the news next week, and we'll have our interviews in just a moment. But first, Nuclear Hot Seat needs donations to keep going and growing. Money makes the world go around, and we are no exception. So if you can, please go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the homepage, click on the big red Donate button, and know that any amount you choose to share with us will be deeply appreciated. Vicki Nelson has been a follower of Nuclear Hot Seat for several years. And when she let me know last week through a little Facebook exchange that we did what she's been doing to help the women and children of Fukushima, I insisted that she talk to me on the record. Vicki went to Fukushima in 2012 to offer flowers from Hawaii intended to cheer people up, as well as provide an invitation to those living in the radiation zone to come visit her home in Hawaii where they could breathe fresh air, swim in the ocean, and eat good food. That's how she started the nonprofit Fukushima Friends Incorporated, a program that puts Fukushima radiation refugees in people's homes for a stay of up to three months or longer if the visas can be managed. She joined us via Skype from the Big Island of Hawaii, along with one of her homestay guests, Tokiko Noguchi, visiting from Fukushima with her 10-year-old son. The interpreter pressed into service for this interview, Kea Uehara, is a volunteer from a local school, and he did a terrific job on short notice, despite not being trained as an interpreter or being familiar with nuclear issues. We all spoke together last week. Vicki Nelson and Tokiko Noguchi, thank you so much for being my guests on Nuclear Hot Seat. Yes, thank you very much for having us join you today. Appreciate it. Vicki, you live in Hawaii. When and how did you become active in Fukushima-related issues? Uh, after the disaster, I had been speaking with a friend of mine, Yumiko Khan, and asking her how I could help, uh, what there were needs for, and I didn't hear from her for a while. I think it was just so much trauma. We weren't sure what we could do. Uh, we're just two women and little resources, and we just talked about it over the phone and prayed about it over the Skype. And then one day she asked me to come over for a Sunflower Day, which was being held in Fukushima, to cheer people up. It provided clothing and food and a way for people to get out. And uh, she asked me to bring flowers from Hawaii. How long after the disaster began on March 11 of 2011 did this take place? In December 2012. So about a year and a half, maybe a little bit more than that afterwards. Yeah. What was that experience like for you, and what did that lead to? Well, when I arrived, we had this event, and the radiation started to affect me right away. My eyes started to burn, and my throat started to hurt, and... I felt some pain a little bit in my chest on the left side. So I didn't say too much because I was trying to encourage other people. But then I, my friend Yumiko said, you look like you have a rash on the top of your head. And I believe uh, that was one of the first symptoms also that I was experiencing radiation contact. And then we went to various places for people with disabilities, all of their um, shelters where the people have been taken and just provided these small little constructions to live in. And we were trying to encourage them with flowers from Hawaii and, and cheering with songs and trying to encourage people so that they could see a face from Hawaii and 
I have hope that maybe they would be able to come to Hawaii and find a respite to get out of their troubles, to get out of the radiation. And uh, so we, we traveled for 10 days straight, every day, very hard, very busy in uh, facilities with people with disabilities and went to the ocean and saw where the disaster came. And we actually, <laughs> we went as close as the government is allowing people to go, which is very, very, very close. And the guards were yelling at us, oh, get out of here, you know. And uh, we actually, none of us should have been allowed in that area. It was extremely high, uh, 0.9, I think, in one place. And we just didn't know how much danger we were in, but at the same time, we went and we saw we were at Minamisoma and, and various places along the shoreline to see the disaster that came through and took people's lives away. Tokiko, where are you from in Japan and what happened for you both on 3.11.11 and in the immediate aftermath? I live in Fukushima, Japan. So I'm pretty sure the tsunami didn't hit there. She only had the effects of the tsunami and a little bit of the earthquake. So she was only worrying about the tsunami maybe coming to her place, but she didn't know about the radiation yet. Until March 12th, she actually didn't even know there were nuclear power plants in Fukushima. Wow. She learned about the word radiation on the 12th because she didn't know about it before that. And on the 15th, she left Fukushima. Where did you go when you left Fukushima? She went to Iwate-ken, which is north of Fukushima. And were you by yourself or were there family members with you? She was with her husband, her 12-year-old daughter, and her 7-year-old son, and they all moved together. Where did you go and what did you face when you were in the place you evacuated to? So what actually happened was they didn't move per se, but they kind of got away for a little bit. And her daughter actually didn't want to switch schools, so they went back after a month. And are you currently living in Fukushima? Yes, they live in the same place now. What has been the hardest thing for you and your children to face since the accident began? What is a uh, A2 count? Yeah, actually. A A1 A2 B C. Ah, no. ah, ah, I know about that. I know about that. <laughs> uh, my daughter, my son, A2. That's the thyroid test that shows that there are yes. nodules of a particular size on the thyroid. So both your son and your daughter have these gross, these nodules on their thyroid. It didn't get large, but they were just, they had a lot of them though, apparently, just that they didn't really get big. And that's apparently what the A2 yeah. result means. Yes, that refers to the size, but the fact that there were a lot of them is also significant. It's important to know. What about yourself and your husband? Have you had difficulties with your thyroids or any other part of your health? The husband actually didn't test, but she tested and there was just one small one. And how long ago was that? She checks every year and, and that was the result for the most recent one. So, Vicky, let's take this back to you now. How did you and Tokiko meet, and what has been your involvement? Okay, my friend Yumiko Khan, who lives in Japan, and she and I, uh, originally we started to know each other because she works with people with disabilities, and so do I. Our business has uh, people working in flowers and foliage in Hawaii, and she is a horticulture therapist and trying to help people find jobs or job training or trying to give them a better life through healing of plants, healing with plants. 
And so she and I met years ago, and then, uh, as I mentioned, when the disaster happened, I kept asking her, what can I do? I don't know what to do. And so uh, she has gone throughout Japan, various people that she knows, various churches that she knows, um, speaking to them, asking for children or for people with disabilities if they would like to come to Hawaii, because I told her, that I would open my home to anybody who wanted to come and get out of the radiation. And I I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I just said, let's just do it. Just send them here. And uh, so she originally got a loan, a private loan, under her own name. And we didn't have a, we don't still have a nonprofit title for it, but... We ended up with money enough to send some people here and help pay for their airfare. And then once they were here, I just put it together myself and uh, used a lot of credit cards and <laughs> asked a lot of people to volunteer help and provide food or or gas or whatever. But it's been slow in the making because of the trust level of, you know, people coming to some place that they don't know. I'm not a regular tour company. I'm just a mom and we have a, a home that's open for them to come and experience some time of respite and eat different food. And what we've been experiencing also is that every single person that, that comes has a reaction to the change as soon as they come here. There's been people who have vomited. They've been having nosebleeds. They've been dizzy. Uh, they've been very ashen in color. And this is once they have left Japan. In other words, yes. it is the lack of the radiation that allows them to then have these reactions to. It's, it's like it's expelling from their body. There's diarrhea. There's nosebleeds. Almost every single person has had uh, nosebleeds on their pillow, you know, I find blood, and then they don't want to tell me that they have these reactions, you know, they're embarrassed. Vomiting, uh, Tokiko-san vomited the whole first week practically, and diarrhea, and we actually took him to the hospital because we felt that he was dehydrated, and they did run tests, and they said, yes, he was dehydrated, so he was kept overnight at the Hilo Hospital in uh, on the big island and cared for. Everybody just adored him. He's just the cutest little 10-year-old that you ever saw. He has Down syndrome. Tokiko, how did you become involved with Vicky and with Fukushima Friends? Again, from Yumiko Khan, Vicky's friend. So because Tokiko was staying at Fukushima, Yumiko found her and told her that she should move out. Tokyo actually borrowed a house in Okinawa, which is rather safe, for one year, but she actually only went there once. So she didn't get to move out, I guess. Yeah. So Yumiko offered she should do detox camps. And this detox would be with Fukushima friends in Hawaii? Yes. What does the program consist of when people come over from Japan and what does it do for them? Well, right now we're really grassroots. I'm just a mom. I'm not a professional medical doctor or a psychologist or psychiatrist, but we just offer love and kindness and a bed and fresh air and grass to run and play and swings to swing on. And I, I have 13 grandchildren, so they can run around with their grandchildren when they come over. And uh, we go to the ocean and take in a lot of uh, picnics and just uh, enjoy some kind of fun and get the troubles out of your mind and meet people here in Hawaii. Um, one of the things I'm really involved with uh, is Christian uh, fellowship with other people and they've been opening their arms and opening their homes to help out and so we are um, we are sharing with people and asking them to provide homestays and then um, also every day we have a Bible study and just trying to help everybody understand who God is that he is a loving father of us all and if someone isn't Christian, can they still participate in the program? Is there any limitation? 
No, there's no limitation at all, but the understanding is that we explain before they come that they will have opportunity if they desire to go to church or to meet people who do go to church and that we are all over the community, all over the island doing things. So they're meeting lots of variety of people and sharing in music and dance and anything that anybody provides on the island. I go through the calendar of events that maybe hula is available, you know, maybe uh, singing is available, uh, whatever. So that's not based on Christianity, but that is the underlying mission of my heart is that I share God's love with everybody. Mm -hmm. How long do people come for when they come to be part of this program? What is the average stay? Well, right now, uh, Rintaro has been here three months, and that's the maximum for the visa currently. We're hoping that we can establish some sort of job training program that's fun and job experiences for anybody because under a job training program, we understand that the uh, visa can be under like a year extension of time. And uh, what we're trying to do, uh, we have some land. Unfortunately, it needs to be purchased and sold because we do have a mortgage, but we have land. So we're looking for hopeful people that would invest in Fukushima and we were my husband said he'd be happy to try and build homes on the land for them to come and then they're not necessarily in a program they have freedom to do what they want rent cars or whatever they'd like to do but at the moment we're just a simple family that's opening our doors so I don't have everything put together perfectly but Sometimes they've come six weeks, two weeks, four weeks, just depending on what they can afford to take away from their life over in Japan. I'd like them never to go back. (laughs) That would be nice if it can be accomplished. When you say you help people detox from radiation, other than getting out of that immediate environment at Fukushima, are there any programs? Are there any protocols that you have them follow to assist them in getting the radiation out of their bodies? At the moment, we're not really doing a huge part of that, but we do have in the works people who grow organically here who will supply the vegetables and the fruit. And of course, Hawaii is plentiful of that, but I'm not a very good cook, so (laughs) I'm not focused on that really. But that's exactly what we need, and so we, we've asked for people to come forward to try to help us. You know, this is in many ways similar to a program called Komoro Homestay that was put together by Laura and Gichi Inoue in Japan, which allows for Fukushima mothers and their children to get away at least for three or four weeks at a time. And I'm wondering, have you had any contact with any other groups or any other individuals who are providing homestay opportunities? Yumiko's doing that because I don't speak Japanese. Uh, She's been the one who's doing the resourcing over there. And I know that she's got many, many places, but I haven't heard of that one particularly. In closing, Tokiko, is there anything you want to say to the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat? Please help protect the kids. Thank you very much, is what she said. And if people want to learn more about the Fukushima Friends program or learn about how this structure of providing homestay is proceeding, is there a website they can visit? Yes, it's called Love neverfailsjapan.com and you can donate or you can contact us by email fukushimafriends at gmail.com Tokiko safe journey to you are you returning to Fukushima in the near future with your son or will you be able to stay in Hawaii now? This Friday they're going to actually just go back to Fukushima May you be able to find a place where you and your family can be safe from the radiation, or as safe as possible. Thank 
Kokiko has a website of her work that she's doing in helping children to find respite. It's called aaa3a.jp. And she has about 150 mothers in Japan who are monitoring the community and they provide this information on a blog. And they are all interested in the health and safety and welfare of the children of Fukushima that are still residing there for one reason or another. And she's also uh, made contact with people in Australia yeah. and in Italy um, and Hokkaido and Okinawa, Okinawa, various different places that they are providing respite for the children and the families. She just wants the children to have a bright future and be protected so that we can have that future. Amen to that. That was Vicki Nelson of Fukushima Friends and Tokiko Noguchi, one of her guests at the program. This was done through interpreter Keia Uehara. Links to the websites for Fukushima Friends and Tokiko Noguchi's work will be found on the website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number 207. Next, we revisit an interview with Laura and Gichi Inoue from Nuclear Hot Seat number 155, exactly one year ago on June 10, 2014. Laura and Gichi founded Komoro Homestay, a program which sponsors families with small children to come to the relative safety of the Komoro Nagano region in southwest Japan from their homes in Fukushima. In this interview, we discuss different aspects of the stress and danger to which families are exposed, as well as the political and social pressures being brought to bear against any who dare to speak out about radiation dangers. Laura and Geechee Inoue, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Nice to be here. Nice to be here, yes. First of all, where do you live in Japan in relationship to Fukushima? We are... Four or five hours drive from uh, Fukushima. Distance is one of the key factors. But the other factor is that we are in the middle of mountain, high mountain, so that according to that uh, study of Chernobyl's case, that the radiation doesn't go over the mountain. So that we first predicted that uh, our place is much safer than around in Fukushima, including Tokyo, so that we started this program. When okay. did you first become aware of the impact of the earthquake and tsunami on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant? And what was your immediate response? First, that um, these broadcasted on the news. As it was uh, happening. Yes. Actually, that I studied some of the nuclear fusion when I was in university, so that I could tell that uh, can happen. A certain risk was there, and um, especially that according to my business experience, that's a big organization like TEPCO or the government, they're very slow in decision making and so on, so that I was alerted the way they dealt with this accident. And Laura, yes. how was the impact on you and what was your immediate response as you became aware of the problem with the nuclear reactor and through Geechee's response, what you knew was going to be happening for the people? Well, my response was really filtered through Geechee because he had the knowledge both of matters nuclear and of the insides of big businesses and how they managed or mismanaged things. And together we became immediately aware that the consequences of this could be very, very bad. And as the weeks mm. unfolded, we were proved to be unfortunately right. I felt, that was um, <laughs> logical thinking, that uh, I felt in front of you that when, if you be in that, uh, the site of the fire and then that the house is burning and then inside the house, burning a house, some children or families are there, then you cannot stay or stand by. You, uh, get, you try to you, get them out. You, 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 you just want to do something. That's the first very strong arch of that, uh, my feeling, to do something rather than just stand by and then on look us. How did you determine that you were going to focus on the needs of mothers and children 
to mm-hmm. get out of the radiation zone. How quickly did that concept come up, and what did you do to start working on it? There are two holes. One is that because I was working in that's a big company, and then that's a, their nature of slow decision making, and then that's a not decide properly, and then not ready to take responsibility. So that that is a human risk, and then that's a I could tell that ordinary weak people, especially the weakest children, could be the victim or the result of this big organization slowness and so on. So that we decided, I decided to take care of them or do something to them because that's a, most of that big organization, including local government, it's the last thing they think about. Well, the last thing they think about are the powerless. Yes. What actions did you take to facilitate an outreach to the mothers and children of Fukushima? And how much participation was there by others in Komoro to do mm-hmm. this with you? We knew some of that um, volunteer group, three or four in our neighbors, so that I just proposed to form this volunteer group to support and help these families. And then they agreed upon. And then that many people felt in urge of doing something. Three or four local volunteers, activists around us, I asked to form this volunteer group to start with. And then they agreed. And then also we asked local church priest who is running the, the kindergarten to join in to the, so this volunteer group. And then they all agreed. So that's, that's how we started. That was three days after this uh, massive fallout of that radiation occurred. So this started virtually while the disaster was still unfolding at its worst. Uh, yes. Laura, how yes. did you reach out to the mothers and children in Fukushima to let them know that you were going to be offering them a place to come and stay, at least temporarily, to get out of the radiation zone? We were fumbling. We didn't really know how to do this, but we started through acquaintances and networks other uh, people had, and they didn't, didn't work very well. But what worked in the end were websites aimed at young mothers And so Gigi put the information on one or two websites like this, and the responses came pouring in, more more than we could cope with. Yes. First, the end of March and the April, May, we tried to use this anti-nuclear activist channel. That's one thing. Within a week after we formed this group, uh, one of that um, group member found three guest house empty so that we can use that for the the homestay facilities. So that after that, we sent all this notice at the beginning of April to first anti-nuclear activist channel. And then second, we tried to use the church channel from Komoro Church to to Date City and then Fukushima City. But that didn't work because the actual ordinary mothers, not within these channels, maybe that the local priest didn't know how to pass this information to ordinary families and the mothers who were struggling. Fortunately, we found a website of the mothers who were exchanging all this information and their opinions. Two sites. I put this onto home state program and then that's a possibility. And then within a half a day, we've got 130 applicants. Wow. With getting this overwhelming number of applicants, how did you move forward to process and bring mothers and children to Comoro to stay? How is the program actually set up? In the end, 22 families, 44 children in total over the summer holidays, we could manage. And then we prioritize that uh, these applicants and then that uh, around the area where most of the uh, contaminated area to start with. And uh, also that the age of children, small babies are more dangerous. 
So that unfortunately we only accepted 22. It was heartrending to have to select people. And yes. I'll never forget the evening when all the applicants, first applications were flooding in. They first rang this, actually it was a Methodist minister, and he couldn't cope with the telephone calls. They were just yes. coming, 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 and many of the callers were in tears yes. and could barely speak. Anyway, finally it settled down and we selected these people who came. And we, one other thing we did was to put, to prioritize during the summer holidays, those with school aged children. And the smaller ones, where there were no school aged children could come after the holidays were yes. over. Yes. Because they w- weren't bound by school terms. And this was the stage when they just had to get away. We, they weren't thinking about settling anywhere or, or, or anything for the future. It was just the immediate few weeks. First notice was for the summer holiday, but also we extended this scheme and then that, uh, even after the, the summer holidays. That first year, we didn't restrict the stay period only for the summer holiday. We extended the summer facility for two families to stay nearly half a year. Within that time, they could find somewhere to move out. Seven families out of 22 who came to homestay over the summer holiday, these seven families moved out, and then we helped them to find the house in Komoro and in Nagano cities and so on. We here in the West do not necessarily understand Japanese culture well enough to understand the pressures faced and still being faced by families in Fukushima. What were and are some of the stresses on the mothers and children? There are three major stress and uh, issues they had. One is that fear to let the children play outside and then touch anything outside. So when they came to that homestay, even the uh, small children around three or four years old, just ask mother everything. Can I touch this sand? Can I touch this flowers? And then so on. So that, that, that's quite a natural thing for the small children. That's one of uh, that uh, stress. And then also another thing is that the lack of proper information. Once this information comes out, it's too late. Like that, the, how much contamination was in that water, for instance. They found out later that they were there waiting for that water with the children outside with that, all this contaminated uh, air. After they found all this, what happened with the delayed information, they very, very strongly regret by finding out what happened to them and for their children. One family that used uh, the bottled water, very expensive, to wash everything because that they fear the tap water. They, she used uh, without knowing that how much contamination was in there and then let the children drink and then use. And then ever after she found out that delayed information, how much it was contaminated, then she had a very strong regret and then even if that it's you know, went back to normal, that she never touches that tap water. That's sort of that kind of a mental and stress. And at the same time, that not to be able to talk about this worry and their health and so on. I understand that there was a tremendous yes. amount of repression that yes. – people were not supposed to raise the issue and still are not supposed to raise the issue of yes. radiation as relates to their health, be it nosebleeds or fatigue yeah. or the other yes. issues yes. that are coming about with people's health, that they're not supposed to yeah. talk about it at all. Yeah, yeah. Even these mothers who came to homestay for that first summer, most of them didn't tell neighbors and the relatives, they were joining to this, came to Nagano, uh, Komoro. They are afraid of being, how to say, <laughs> criticized or the, the traitor or something. So that was the atmosphere. So they were not even supposed to admit that there was any risk 
as opposed to the fact yeah. that they were taking actions to try and mitigate yeah. the risk that they were that they yeah. were literally yeah. under. Yeah. They were not talking about this uh, risk with the neighbors. And then that uh, even that some of the neighbors are telling these mothers that everything is okay. But looking out at outside, no children was playing outside. Even if they're not talking about you know, inside their mind, they're worrying about, but cannot speak out. Laura, you wrote in one of our communications that in Fukushima, there is a conspiracy of silence. What did you mean by that? That was immediately after the accident. And one of the applicants who actually never came, it was her seven-year-old who just naturally in class, as children do, were talking about going to Comoro, and the teacher picked her out and told her in front of the class that she was a traitor. A traitor? Yeah. A traitor. She used, he used the word in Japanese for traitor. It's appalling. I mean, we were deeply shocked by that. Simply because they were going to Comoro to get out of the radiation for a period of time. Yes, you have to stick in Fukushima and support it. Otherwise, chickening out is treachery. And there seems to have been no attempt mentally to distinguish between sticking together and rebuilding after the earthquake and tsunami, which is realistic, and how you deal with radiation. And the only response to that is to flee. It's quite different. Some people didn't understand, some people deliberately didn't understand, and there was guidance issued by the Minister of Education to teachers as to how to deal with this. And, and there, it did not include encouraging people to flee. I also understand that there were pressures brought against mothers who were trying to buy safe food and that people were encouraged to trust the government reassurances as opposed yes. to questioning them. Yes. Ministry of Education issued some handbook for the school teachers and then headmasters uh, in that education area. And then in that handbook, they put, rather than radiation and then their risk, they put that mental stress can be more harmful for the, the, the people. If the uh, parents are worrying too much, that may affect children's mental condition. So don't worry too much or don't talk about much of that worry. And then that is guidance or handbook to the teachers so that it's somehow that quite calculated way to create the atmosphere, not to be able to speak or talk about worry, even among parents. Explain for listeners the concept of gaman. It's one of the first words you learn as a foreigner coming to Japan. It means putting up with things, basically, just putting up with things and persevering. And it doesn't really include trying to do something about the cause of your distress or worry. In other words, just put up with it. Just put up with it and carry on, yes. So what kind of education did you share with the mothers before they returned with their families to Fukushima, at least the families that did return there? The purpose for this education or, or study session with the mothers, especially those who came to homestead, we saw that it's very important to share this risk and then that, um, to think, discuss together all this risk also that the fact they can do wherever they are to save the children for a long term, that the mothers and the families need to take certain actions rather than us just prepare that home state place and so on. The purpose of this education or the study is for the mothers especially to take everyday action or management to reduce this risk by radiation and then radiation exposure. Some families need to stay in Fukushima who, who cannot move out, but they can do something to reduce the risk. The first year was external exposure because radioactive contamination is very high outside after the massive fallout. So we studied the impact of external 
exposure to the、uh, children's health in form of that the cancer and leukemia and so on. But next year, this settled down a little bit, but this、uh, radiation came into eco cycle and the food chain so that we started to talk about and think about this radioactive contamination comes through that the food and the internal exposure. Well, what Gucci's been doing for the last, in fact, more than the last few weeks, but it's become more intense for the last few weeks, is to go through government Ministry of Agriculture data from the last three years. There's now plenty to compare. In fact, there's umpteen thousand bits of data and try and compile a program so that mothers can look at it and say, say, look up the cabbages from a certain prefecture. How do the safe ones differ from the More dangerous ones by how many becquerels? How many, if I'm looking at that pile of cabbages in the supermarket, what proportion of them are likely to be contaminated? Because they all look the same. In other words, how to choose not necessarily completely safe food, but food that's as safe as you can get day by day. We have to eat something, even if it's not 100% satisfactory. And I understand that the authorities in testing the cabbages come up with an average becquerel count, which can be wildly different from cabbage to cabbage. But they go by safety by saying that there is an average becquerel count that we will consider to be okay. Yes. And then that's、uh, actually that the government issued all this data, and then that the average is quite similar. But what they are doing is set certain criteria too high for the children's health point of view. That's a hundred becquerel per kilogram is too high. Almost any of these、uh, radiated food come into the market. In that situation, that、uh, mothers need to choose which one. If they have some choices, then that they choose a safer one, less contaminated one, or less risky one. But that information is completely missing, and then that the government is just issues the numbers. It's not useful data for mothers for that everyday life, and then that they they cannot make use of all of this data.、Mm. And one of the most horrifying and angering things that I read in your story and some of the materials you sent to me is that you've heard the experts. Say that what Fukushima was experiencing would provide good data. In other words, it was okay for the people to be going through this because the scientists and the statisticians would have some numbers on the other、mm. side, paying no attention to the quality of life and the damage to life that was going on. They're talking about from scientific point of view or the expert point of view. Unless you statistically set up some. Relation or dependency of that this disease or illness, unless they prove that, they're saying it's okay because no proof of that、so、this causes leukemia or something. That is one expert way of talking about this. But in this Fukushima case, nobody can tell the risk that、uh, what will happen in ten years' time. Especially that the low dose, long term impact of the radiation exposure, internal, external, to babies and children who grow up, in, maybe they'll be in ten years' time, that the high school boys or girls. At least, if you identify certain risk, and then you can choose less risky one, and then that another way to look at. But、uh, this government and the expert doesn't provide any. Of that guidance. Let's get back to the、yeah. program that you have been running. We're now coming into our fourth summer since Fukushima happened. Actually, we've stopped counting. There were the original twenty-two families. Then there are others who've joined since. I think it may be about thirty. No, thirty-three. Thirty-three. Okay, you've、yes. been counting, and we very much keep up with them. We keep networking. They really still need support, and we also have a program whereby, during the growing season, we send safe vegetables from here, which they can buy at a reasonable price. They had been, many of them had been ordering from way down south, from Kyushu and Okinawa, and it costs a fortune. 
So we have somebody here who is picking up, the, the, you know, the bendy cucumbers you can't send to the supermarket, but which taste great, and sending people boxes. So we're doing that. And I think the networking is almost the most important thing with the people who've moved here, with the people who haven't and who perhaps can come for the odd weekend and keeping up the discussion. They can't discuss with their neighbours, but they can discuss with us. And then Geechee will provide them with any new information or guidance that he can come up with. What are some of the long-term social pressures that have been showing up in families that are under the pressure of having been in and still being in Fukushima and exposed to the radiation as well as the propaganda? I think that when we see things in our 33 families, we can take it for granted that they are representatives, tips of the iceberg. And there's lots more of the same going on. There was, for example, one family who came here and they were on the verge of divorce several times because the husband said the company says everything's all right. Everything's all right. You're just a religious group, which we're not. And he wanted his wife to have nothing more to do with us. She was dithering because she wanted her little boys to have a father. And she didn't really want to get divorced, but she was also very worried about that health. And it was awful. And when she first came, I'll never forget her attitude, her face. She was like a taut rubber band. It was as though she was about to break. Their problems have, I think, been solved because his company sent him to a much safer area. So they're all now living there. But we're in regular contact. There are lots of pressures, not just from husbands, but from older relatives. There's one family who really wanted to settle here, but couldn't mainly because the older generation refused to let them go and they needed taken care of. All sorts of things that never would have arisen had it not been for the accident. Then there are worries into the future. This is a very Japanese kind of worry that the children who were exposed to radiation would not be able to get married. You know, there was a terrific difficulty in victims of Nagasaki and Hiroshima getting married because of the fear of genetic defect. And now this is carrying over to those children who have been impacted by Fukushima Daiichi. Yes, yes. I mean, the five-year average five-year-olds not worrying about that, but their parents and grandparents are. Where are you now? with the Comoro Homestay Program. And is there a way that listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat would be able to support you in your ongoing work? This is fourth year now. A new family whose children or baby is uh, born after the accident. New generation, second generation coming now. But at the same time, some families who evacuated and then that um, lived some other places for three years. But their financial support by the local government and so on, that the financial support was stopped so that uh, some of the families need to go back to their hometown. And then that uh, their pressure or stress is now coming back so that more mental support for the mothers in that uh, everyday life now, but uh, we need to figure out what they can do in that everyday life wherever they are. And then we, we need to support that. I corrected the data of the, this food contamination and then that uh, for everyday shopping and then everyday food, which is uh, less risky, they can choose. This for some a uh, little bit more useful information form we are preparing and then send it as a newsletter. What is missing now is that this everyday life risk management and then especially long-term risk for children. Uh, The health is not well discussed. To do that, first we need to identify the risk of this long-term exposure and then how to measure the risk and I started to measure these food contamination so on. And then can tell a little bit of differences 
in numbers. But uh, this completely missing part is that how to evaluate these differences to the children's health in the future. Not much information about that is available as far as I studied. So that if somebody in that nuclear hot seat members know about this long term and then that this internal exposure or that um, everyday life health management in that situation like that you in the United States had some experience in this situation. If you know somebody who is listening to this program, know about this data or that some experience, then that uh, uh, we are most welcome to get all this information so that we can tell that mothers that uh, what is the risk of everyday life and then that how that uh, this risk may affect children's future uh, health and so on. And how to manage it. How to manage it. It's We'd be important. very, very grateful. Yes. What would be the contact information for them to reach out directly to you? Please contact through me on my Gmail email address, which is Laura Jane, all one word, 713 at gmail.com. In closing, is there anything you would like to say that perhaps we have not covered that you would like to mention to our listeners? Please don't forget us. Feel yourselves in contact. We're all one worldwide community fighting the effects of nuclear power and its twin brother, nuclear weapons. Don't forget us. Laura and Geechee Inouye. The link to Comoro Homestay will be up on the website under this episode, number 207. Activist shout out. Again, my gratitude to Erica Gray for her diligence in covering the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Oops, We Have a Problem report, letting us know how our aging, leaking, decrepit fleet of nuclear reactors is falling apart one glitch, one week at a time. Here's today's final thought. Next week, I'm marking the fourth anniversary of the start of Nuclear Hot Seat. It was not much more than a conference call with two, count them, two whole people on the line when I started, and look where we are now. I'm intending to edit together some highlights from the past four years, so if you have a favorite nuclear hot seat story or moment, let me know and I'll attempt to include them. Send this information by email, please not Facebook, I lose things that way. Send it to info at nuclearhotseat.com. And for all of you who do, Thanks for listening. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 9, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, NHK, GG Press, Mainichi, Fukuleaks.org, Christian Science Monitor, Sputniknews.com, Asahi.com, Diné, No Nukes.org, TheHill.com, TheGuardian.com, Informable.com, YLE.FI, WalesOnline.co, DailyMail.co.uk, The Incompetence of TEPCO, The PR Hacks and Flacks of World Nuclear News and the World Nuclear Association, and the bright, brave, bold, and extremely good-looking members of the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com and iTunes under podcasts. Our archive is available on the website or on iTunes, and our YouTube channel carries the show under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. Thank you so much, Joni Ray, for doing that. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, Send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now, do not go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat.